In today's episode, Etsy adds some perks that sellers don't find all that perky. Amazon Prime Day 2 underwhelms, and I sell some more stuff. What is up, Galaxians? Welcome to another episode of the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. If this is your first time here, my name is Ryan, and I am a full-time reseller, part-time YouTuber, and podcaster working out of my home here in the greater Cincinnati area, and this channel is all about the flip life. We will cover a bunch of reselling news today, and I got a few interesting things at the back end of the show in the What Sold segment, so you'll want to be sure to stick around for that. Uh, if you have uh, been here before and at any point during the proceedings today, you find anything here to be useful or interesting if you're watching on youtube please do me a favor and smack that thumbs up button if you're not yet a subscriber or a follower of the podcast and you get some value today uh please consider following along we would love to have you here but with all of that out of the way let's get straight into some reselling news news updates it's a it's a big big week of reselling news. I don't know how much of it is like super major, but there's some really interesting things going on. So we're going to start over at Etsy. This article over on e-commerce bites, which of course, as always, I will link to these down in the video description and the show notes below. Shoppers can buy Etsy items without ever leaving Google. This is kind of an interesting situation. In some cases, shoppers searching Google can buy items from Etsy sellers without ever visiting the Etsy website thanks to the Google Partner Checkout program. Etsy told sellers on Friday that listings selected for its Etsy offsite ads program may be eligible for such sales. If you're not familiar with that, Etsy has an offsite ad program. They do charge you 15% if an item sells through that program, which is pretty steep. Um, I've had a few things where it has amounted to a fairly significant amount of money. You could make the argument, of course, that it's a sale that you made that you might not have otherwise made without that program, but 15% is pretty stout. I don't believe, if I recall, once you have achieved a certain level, you don't even have the ability to opt out of it. So it just kind of is what it is. Um, they say it generates more sales. Probably close to 50% of my sales on Etsy are through the offsite ads program. So it 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 definitely is a significant portion of your business. In any event, a uh, search for more information shows that offsite ads eligible listings that offer free shipping and don't have variants are the ones that will be eligible. On Etsy's offsite ad program page, which there is a link for in this article, it explains that partner checkout is a feature of Google Shopping that allows US buyers to be able to purchase items from sellers directly from a listing without leaving Google. Etsy explained now when shoppers discover Etsy listings in free product listings, they can check out directly on Google via this partner checkout. Etsy explained what information would be visible to Google shoppers. It includes your listings details, including images, prices, shipping info, and policies, all of which will be displayed on Google. Oddly, the article notes it does not mention the listings description. When a shopper purchases, purchases one of your listings through Google, it will appear on your orders on Etsy. You won't pay an offside ad fee on those sales. So that's great news. <laughs> uh, Etsy said buyers who purchase through Google checkout will receive a Google confirmation email in addition to Etsy's confirmation and shipping emails. Etsy told sellers the new feature makes it easier for shoppers to complete their purchase when they find one of their items. Plus, of course, it can help you reach a new audience of shoppers on Google. So uh, the fact that they're waiving, I'm, I'm going to put this caveat out there, at least for now, the offsite ad fee uh, is pretty cool. But they also announced this week some updates to their Star Seller program. Now, if you've been playing along at home, uh, we've covered the Star Seller program at length for some time now, and it continues to be a source of contention with a lot of sellers on Etsy. They announced some updates to the program. Uh, back in May, they added individual badges to highlight your customer service in June. They streamlined messages and introduced the purchase protection program. Simplified ratings criteria came out in July. In August, they decreased the order minimum. So they've been doing a lot of stuff 
to kind of make the Star Seller program more attainable for more sellers. Beginning in October, they're giving Star Sellers access to live chat support in Shop Manager. We gave Star Sellers early access to live chat with Etsy support team right from Shop Manager. This one-on-one -on -one support is available seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time during the week and from 10 to 6 Eastern on the weekends. You'll have access to live chat for three months after you earn a Star Seller badge, even if your Star Seller status changes. Now, they say in this note that this is a early access. So I assume this may be something that they intend to roll out to all sellers later, which is something we'll get to here in a minute. They are also working on a program called Recurring Auto Replies for Messages. We're adding a new option to our auto reply feature to give you more flexibility. With Recurring Auto Reply, you'll be able to set a weekly schedule to send auto replies when you're offline, for instance, on the weekend. Auto replies do count towards your response rate, helping you earn your star seller badge. We're currently testing out this new feature with a small group of sellers and we'll be incorporating their feedback before, again, making it available to all sellers. So these are pretty interesting announcements for the program, but of course there were a lot of sellers who questioned whether these things should be limited to top sellers. Now, again, my impression from the way those things are worded with early access and all that is that eventually this stuff is gonna come out for all sellers, but they want to test it with a select group of, I guess what they would consider to be their best sellers, people in that star seller program. But it met with a lot of questions about whether these were actually perks. A lot of people felt like this is stuff that sellers should just already have, which I'm not sure I disagree with. Uh, these are seem like pretty basic customer service things that should be available on Etsy. Sellers discussing the new star seller perks shared their thoughts on the Etsy discussion boards and many commenters were underwhelmed and wondered why they weren't available to all sellers. I'm a bit disappointed that support chat is only available to star sellers. That seems dirty in the sense that support would be on an even access platform. Everyone pays the new increased fees, which were to go to added support. However, now it's contingent on your star seller status. Uh, another one said, apparently these people have no idea what an actual perk is. I was completely nonplussed. They said every legit seller is deserving support from the corporate shills that rake in our fees. <laughs> uh, the, the negativity, man, on some of these posts is just, I don't, I don't know why people just don't stop selling. But anyway, that's an editorial comment for another day. Uh, an actual perk might be preferred placement in searches or removal of competitor listings from our own listing pages. Uh, customer support should not be a perk. It's a bare minimum we should expect after nearly doubling our fees and for forcing participation in their offside ad gouge. Star Seller Program does not allow us as sellers to decide which of our buyers are worthy of receiving prompt replies to messages or issues. We're expected to offer the same level of service to all of our customers, yet they think it is fine for them to offer different levels of customer service to us as sellers, depending on whether we can jump through their ill-conceived hoops. Again, I, I feel like all of this is, it's understandable. I, I agree. I think a lot of these features should have probably been on Etsy, maybe from the start and certainly some time ago. They're a long enough established organization to have basic things like chat support for sellers. But my reading of their press release would say that these things are currently being tested kind of with star sellers and eventually we'll probably roll out to everyone. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes. But the knee jerk reaction to Etsy's perks is that they're not, uh, they're not really all that in the proverbial bag of chips. Continuing on with Etsy and <clears throat> this could probably happen to anybody and it could probably happen on, on any site but there's an article on Vancouver is awesome. A Vancouver Etsy shop owner hijacked and over 300 customers were scammed. Customers were being scammed out of from 200 to a thousand dollars for items that didn't even exist. So essentially what happened here, this person stopped selling on Etsy and someone took over their account and started selling, quote unquote, bogus merchandise. One Vancouver Etsy shop owner says her shop was hijacked by hackers who scammed over 300 of her customers by selling them items that did not exist. She was not even aware of the hack until recently on Wednesday morning. 
She started receiving messages from people asking for refunds and assistance with their orders. She says, having not listed any items on my shop since almost a year ago, she took the messages to be spam. Later that day, however, she became suspicious because, quote, every two minutes I would get one of these messages from somebody. I looked at my shop and saw that a lot of old listings that I'd sold in the past had been relisted at crazy prices. Though her shop looked the same, retaining her name and photos, the hackers had changed the email address and password used to log in. They would have, of course, also, she says, had to change my banking information to get the deposits from the shop. Uh, fortunately, the shop owner still had access to customer messages using her personal account, which was still linked to the shop, and she was able to respond to them, telling them to seek help. Eventually, the hacker caught on and hacked the personal account as well and shut it down completely. She says they've also taken down her website. So these are some these are some pro hackers. <laughs> they've totally got her locked down. Uh, prior to being locked out, she last heard people were being scammed out of anywhere from $200 to $1,000. And despite her efforts to shut down the shop with Etsy's help, the shop sale tally shows around 350 new transactions since the thing started. So do what you can to protect your accounts. There, I mean, obviously, there are some basic things. They say don't use the same password on multiple sites, which I know most people are really bad at doing because it's it's hard enough to remember one password, let alone 20 or 30 if you have on a site the availability of using two-factor authentication using either the google authenticator app or receiving a text from the site do those things to help try to protect yourself i probably for my part once a week will get a notification saying and here is your code to get into your site which means somebody is trying to get into one of my accounts so it's a, a very prevalent problem i had a situation actually this week where a a buyer reached out to me and said, hey, I don't know what's going on here, but a friend of mine bought this book from you, but somehow they bought it on my account. It's not on my charge card, but it's in, it looks like it was purchased through my Etsy shop. I, of course, have no way of knowing how that would have happened. I suggested that that person contact Etsy directly and see if they could get to the bottom of it. They indicated to me they were just going to close <laughs> uh, their Etsy shop. <clears throat> completely. So there you go. But uh, again, safety is a concern online and uh, apparently it can happen to anyone. So just be aware of that. We talked last week, Amazon was going to have a second Prime Day. Actually, before we get into that, here's an interesting article. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth with this, but we we talk a lot about how how big eBay used to be and where it is now. This is an article over on Marketplace Pulse, how Amazon stole the world from eBay. And it's got this, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this map pop up and it shows from 2003 until 2020, the change in the market dominance from eBay to Amazon. And it's, it's mind blowing, essentially everything. I think every country in the world save one by 2022, the top search term, in those markets is Amazon, not eBay, where back in 2003, it was all eBay, pretty much everywhere in the world. So interesting article, go check it out. I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail, but they talk about how Amazon and eBay, who were at one point fairly neck and neck, have grown obviously in very, very separate directions. Uh, Amazon shoppers shrug off second Prime Day sale. Amazon's 48-hour Prime early access sale ran through Wednesday. Data from third-party analysts shows that the discount event failed to attract as many shoppers as Amazon's Prime Day back in July. But one analyst did suggest that it accomplished what Amazon set out to do, which was reduce a glut of product in its warehouses. We talked about the inventory situation at retailers and obviously big online outfits like Amazon several episodes ago where companies are actually canceling and cutting back on orders as we head into fourth quarter, which seems completely counterintuitive to me, but they're doing it because they have entirely too much stock. And this analyst at least thinks that's one of the reasons that Amazon decided to have this second prime day and that it was probably to that point at least successful. The article says, uh, as shoppers appear to have shrugged off promotions like discounted phone chargers and air fryers, the 48-hour event dubbed the Prime Early Access Sale ran through Wednesday. For Amazon, 
the event tested how many members of its Prime subscription program would respond to two major discount events in the same year after the company's Prime Day sale in July. They said, Amazon said on Thursday, that tens of millions of Prime members ordered more than 100 million items from third-party vendors. It disclosed little else about the results, including sales figures. For my part, I probably visited... I don't know, 15 times <laughs> over the two days looking for something that I thought was a great deal that I couldn't live without. And I ended up with, I think, a, uh, a set of towels <laughs> uh, for like $12. I didn't, I didn't spend a bunch of money. Anyway, third party uh, data analysts gave a deeper look into how the sequel went. Sales seemed lighter. Compared to Prime Day in July, a Bank of America analyst said they estimate Amazon brought in $5.7 billion in revenue versus $7.5 billion in July. I wish I had like a, a sound of tears of someone crying for only $5.7 billion in sales in two days. <laughs> uh, wow, that is, it's still a big, big number. That means over the span of four or five days, Throughout the course of the year, Amazon did roughly 13 billion, a little over 13 billion dollars in sales. That's just remarkable. The average order spend during the Prime Early Access sale was $46.68, down from $60.29 on Prime Day, according to the market research firm Numerator. Not everyone is convinced that it was a flop, even if the 48-hour event failed to exceed Prime Day sales. Amazon still likely more, saw more sales on Tuesday and Wednesday than it would have on a typical day. Of course, I think it did fine for what Amazon was trying to do, which was reduce the amount of products they have in their warehouses. One of the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago was the Amazon FBA restrictions and limiting your ability to send stuff in. One of the reasons for that is there's just too much inventory in these warehouses. So this hopefully will help with all of those situations. Another situation that Amazon is having some problems with that we've talked about on this show before is fake reviews. And this article in the New York Post talks about people are getting creepy, empty envelopes in the mail and experts blame sellers on Amazon. People across the U.S. lately have been receiving mysterious empty packages in the mail and experts are blaming shenanigans by third party merchants on Amazon. A flurry of yellow padded envelopes have landed in the residential mailboxes across more than 30 states over the past several weeks, according to Safely HQ. The Consumer Reporting website's founder, Patrick Quaid, estimates the mystery packages could number as high as 10,000. While recipients mainly have been puzzled, some have expressed alarm, fretting that their names and addresses may have been leaked in a data breach. Some have braced for the worst, speculating that the apparently empty envelope might contain something sinister and invisible. That's the that's the world we live in now. You get a empty envelope and you assume that it's got anthrax or something in it. Uh, that's also a topic for another day. I go outside and rip the top off of the package open and held it away from my face and pinched it open to see no contents inside. I felt I left it outside and I'm about to dispose of it in the trash receptacle, said one recipient. Many of the empty packages have listed the sender as an online seller at the address of an Amazon warehouse facility. In several cases, a particular one in the San Francisco Bay Area suburb of Tracy, California. While this article notes that is the legitimate Amazon facility, the packages in question were not mailed from there, company representatives told the Post. Instead... Amazon officials are suggesting that the situation had all the hallmarks of a known scam called brushing, in which third-party merchants create fake, fake transactions on the site, complete with tracking numbers and confirmations that the packages have been received. After spending a modest outlay on these phantom mailers, which maybe cost 3 to $4 each to sell with postage, the rogue sellers then create phony customer reviews for little-known products that they are trying to sell, said James Thompson, a former Amazon executive who is now a consultant to online sellers. He says, if you can confirm the package addressed to you wasn't ordered by you or anyone you know, report the package online by going to the Report Unwanted Package form on Amazon. Amazon investigates these reports and takes action when we find bad actors. According to a website called Fake Spot, a, deter a service that detects fake reviews, and this just blew me away, about 42% of Amazon reviews were not written by actual customers. 42%. That's damn near half 
of the reviews on Amazon are fake. Uh, mind blowing. That is just Amazon clearly needs to do something to try to get that under control. The federal government uh, apparently agrees with me. They have expressed concerns about the growing number of fake reviews on e-commerce sites, and the FTC has vowed to fine Amazon and others if they don't remove them. In February, a former Amazon consultant was sentenced to 10 months in prison and a $50,000 fine for participating in a scheme to bribe Amazon employees to manipulate the company's third-party marketplace. The case is still going ongoing with five other defendants still facing prosecution. So I guess the, the moral of the story is when you see good reviews, I always, I'm, I'm one of those people, I always go and look at like the three and the four star reviews, not the five star reviews, because I have come to the point, I knew it was bad, but 42% bad kind of shocked me, but that I just don't trust many of the top reviews. And a lot of them, if you read the actual comments in the review, they don't appear to have been written by actual humans. <laughs> they just, uh, the English makes no sense. It's pretty bad. So in any event, uh, that's going on over at Amazon. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the um, new kind of marketplace um, whatnot. And we talked with Katie Reeds about her use of it in selling books. And one of the things that she talked about was that there was not the ability to ship media items through whatnot by media mail. Uh, Katie announced for us earlier in the week that you can now use media mail shipping on whatnot. I'm going to just link to her video in the show notes and the com in the video description down below. It's like a nine minute video. It does a really good job of covering what's going on over at whatnot and the addition of media mail to whatnot's marketplace. So if you sell over there and you sell books, this is big news. I will let her do a better job covering it than I could because she sells over there. So please go check out Katie's video on the addition of media mail shipping to whatnot. Speaking of whatnot, here's something I did not know about them. They are a partner in a outfit that publishes comic books, and they are now going to be the new publisher of Heavy Metal Magazine, <laughs> uh, which I got to admit, I didn't even know was still being published. Whatnot Publishing is a collaboration between Whatnot, whose live streaming sales platform increased in popularity during the pandemic shutdown, and Starburns Industries Press the publishing arm of the animated studio responsible for shows like Rick and Morty, Animals, uh, and Happy Tank. They began publishing comics earlier this year and have lined up a number of high-profile titles based on ex existing media properties or with Hollywood stars. And now they have signed a deal to be the new publisher of Heavy Metal Magazine and related titles starting next year. And it includes distribution to the direct market of comic book store and bookstore distribution too. That means a relaunch of Heavy Metal Magazine for the very first time. I guess I was right. It wasn't in existence. <laughs> uh, Heavy Metal Magazine has been through a number of owners and controllers over recent years with stories of internal coups, challenging comings and goings, non-delivery to customers, uh, callous callousness and challenges from creators, former employees, and so on. It's never dull, they say, over at Heavy Metal Magazine. Issue number 321 will be out next year and will instead be Heavy Metal Volume 2, number one, a total relaunch of the anthology magazine with a $9.99 cover price and a tiered pricing plan for retailers and subscribers. They list some other collaborations that are coming out between these two companies. So again, uh, like we talk about in our reselling business, diversifying where you sell and what you sell, having more platforms, kudos to whatnot for having additional businesses in their arsenal where they're able to make money. Very cool. Uh, more acquisitions in the kind of reselling market. The sneaker reseller Goat is set to acquire streetwear site Grailed. Grailed has been kind of up and down. This deal is part, this article on Bloomberg notes, of increasing consolidation in resale following the recent, recent Poshmark acquisition. We talked about that uh, in an episode a couple of weeks ago. And I guess I can't read this article because I'm not a subscriber, but there you go. <laughs> uh, I was able to look at it a couple of days ago and read it, and now it's registering it that it's my second time trying to read this article and I have to subscribe. So I will link to it and maybe you can go see it. But uh, Grailed is being bought by sneaker reseller Goat. 
We've talked about this again on and on and on, moving over to eBay. Fourth and fifth former eBay employees sentenced in cyberstalking case in Boston Federal Court. I'm not going to dig real deep into this. We've covered the kind of the details at some length in previous shows, but two more former employees were sentenced today for their roles in the cyberstalking campaign. Stephanie Pop of Louisville who was eBay's former senior manager of global intelligence, was sentenced to one year and one day in prison and two years of probation. Stephanie Stockwell of Redwood, California, the former manager of eBay's global intelligence center, was sentenced to two years of probation with one year to be served in home confinement. So we talked a couple of weeks ago about a couple of higher executives receiving, I think it was 57 months and 24 months of prison time and some pretty massive fines. So here are two more executives that are being sentenced in that case, the, a case that just keeps giving. It's given, again, additional attention to the site, E-Commerce Bytes. I know the, the founders of that site were due to appear, I think, last week on a local Boston television show to kind of explain their situation. You can go to E-Commerce Bytes. I think there's a link to that if you'd like to check that out. Continuing on, I don't know if I talked about this previously, this news actually broke a couple of weeks ago and it just kind of popped back up in my feed. eBay has abandoned Shopify app five years after its launch. eBay is pulling its app from the Shopify app store five years after launching it as an easy way for merchants on the Shopify platform to list their items on its marketplace. It appears that for many months, the app was failing to sync listings between the two platforms anyway. <laughs> uh, well, Seth, there you go. Uh, news of the eBay app's demise appeared on a back-end page on Zendesk on October 4th. It is not clear if eBay or Shopify proactively notified sellers of the change. In fact, anyone using the Shopify app store as of Thursday would have been unaware that if they began using the app, it would only be available to them for two months unless they took the time to read the recent reviews from users. On January 1st, 2023, the eBay app on Shopify is scheduled to be discontinued eBay encouraged sellers to find another app to use if they wish to continue to post their Shopify hosted items on eBay. So I don't know, I don't know how many people were using it. My, my gut instinct is it's probably not very many if eBay feels that they can just get rid of it without much difficulty. Lastly, in the news, uh, something a little more fun. Uh, two never-before-published Nintendo Entertainment System games are now up for auction on eBay. The Video Game History Foundation is trying to raise money to win these auctions so they can share these never-before-seen games with the public. When Frank Cifaldi, founder and co-director of the Video Game History Foundation, finds an unreleased original NES game on eBay, it's cause for celebration. Unearthing never-before-published games is his research kink, according to him, and discoveries only happen once every five years. However, last week he found two. There are currently two unreleased, one-of-a-kind, never-digitized games for the original NES on eBay right now. This has literally never happened before. Our resources are stretched thin and we could use help. So they're trying to raise money so that their organization can buy these. One game, Battlefields of Napoleon, got so far along in its development process that it actually has finalized box art. But the game, sadly, never saw the light of the retail stores. The other game is even rare. It's a demo for the infamous Power Glove, which was developed by Rare and is one of only five known games for the peripheral in existence. If you count the two games Nintendo announced but never actually released. Uh, Cifaldi is now trying to raise funds to win both of these auctions so they the games can be preserved and their contents shared with the public. So if you're inclined to donate to that sort of thing rather than trying to win these auctions yourself, there's a link in this article to go help them raise funds. So that is a lot of reselling news. We have now consumed almost the entire normal length of one of these podcasts. So I'm gonna keep this thing moving right along and let's get into some stuff that I sold last week. This will be fairly short and sweet. I think I've only got like five or six things. This first one is a lot of James Mishner paperbacks. So I, I've talked over the last few episodes about how I'm going through these thousands of paperbacks, and a lot of them are all but worthless individually. Many of them are selling for less than what the cost to actually ship them would be 
over on eBay. So what do you do with those? In some cases, I'm absolutely just discarding them because they're not, they're, it's not really even worth building lots of. Um, for instance, I have an entire box full of Mary Higgins Clark novels, which even in lots are bringing less than a dollar a book. And I'm just not going to spend the time to do those. But these James Missioner books in some cases are not too terrible. In this case, what I did was I built a lot of eight uh, that included Caribbean, Centennial, Chesapeake, Hawaii, Legacy, Mexico, Poland, and Space. And I listed these things for $19.99 plus media mail shipping. So about $250 a book, which isn't too hateful. Uh, again, with that big of a box with media mail shipping, you really save some money on the shipping end. So that makes it a little more palatable. I've listed quite a few of these lots and sold one at full price for $19.99 plus $7.51 media mail shipping. So again, and I've talked about it before, another opportunity to make a little bit of money on books that otherwise would appear to be worthless is to lot them up. Sometimes I'll do two or three. In this case, I did eight and made 20 bucks. My cost of goods sold on these books is less than five cents a piece. So even if we call it five cents a piece, I got 40 cents in this and sold it for 20 bucks. A record. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really close to not doing records anymore. They're kind of a pain to ship and especially like 78s that you really have to protect and that. And it's just one of those things I I don't know. It would take a pretty special collection probably for me to buy another big lot of records. But I did sell this three LP set Bach, the little organ book from Columbia Masterworks. Uh, this was, I can't remember the date on this. It's fairly old, three LP set. I own it for probably a quarter as part of a big estate buyout that I did, which is how I ended up with a box full of Ray Conniff records that I bring up <laughs> from time to time. Uh, but there were a few items in there that did pretty well. I had this listed originally at $29.99 with free shipping. I'm currently running a 30% off sale. It got caught up in that and sold for $20.99 with free shipping. So again, not too hateful from a quarter to 20 bucks but uh again there's just there's so many bad records out there if you're if you're not individually selecting records and buying big lots you end up with a significant amount of junk another paperback book i talked over the last couple of weeks about some of these true crime books and how well they're doing here's another instance uh the cauldron of blood the matamoros cult killings by jim schutz from 1989 this was a first printing paperback uh, I had it listed for $29.99. It is also in a 30% off sale right now and went for $20.99 plus media mail shipping. Cost of goods sold on this again is under a nickel. This is one I thought would do a little better. Again, it's a, one of the true crime books. I had it listed at an auction. Some of these had sold for upwards of $60. The Snake and the Spider by Karen Kingsbury. It was a Dell Illustrated paperback first edition from 1995. I put this up at auction uh, at $24.99 plus shipping and didn't hear a thing until within like 30 seconds of the end of the auction. It got one bid at $24.99 and is on its way to its new home. Actually, I think it's already arrived. I think I got feedback for it this morning that they were, I think the, uh, the feedback was something to the effect of, I'm really looking forward to reading this book. And it was like opening a Christmas present. It was so well wrapped in its packaging. So uh, for those who say that kind of stuff does not matter, uh, I beg to differ. It does make a difference when a customer gets a well-protected package something that is not a book. This also sold on eBay. I've sold a couple of these before. I picked these up at a garage sale. It's probably been over a year ago. This is the last one I had from 2009, the John Deere collection, no so fleece throw kit blanket. Uh, this was new with tags, officially licensed item. I picked up four or five of these for about $2 and 50 cents a piece. The first few I sold at full pop, which I was listing them for $39.99 plus shipping. This is in my 30% off sale. So it went for $27.99 plus about 10 bucks for priority mail shipping. So kind of a neat item. They took a while to sell ultimately, but from $250 to probably an average of $35 for the four of them that I sold, I will take it. 
another old book. I talk about these old kind of science textbooks on an almost weekly basis, Fresh Water Biology, edited by W.T. Edmondson. Nothing particularly special about this. It's a second edition, fourth printing. So it's not, you know, the holy grail first printing of a book. It's a second edition, fourth printing from 1966, but still brought $34.99 plus shipping. It was in my, again, my 30% off offer sale. I had it listed for $49.99. This is one out of an estate sale purchase that I own for $1. So that's again, is a pretty decent flip. An another crazy good sale on a paperback. I, I talked last week about, and earlier in this episode, eh, a lot of paperbacks are not worth the cost to ship them. Some of them can be pretty amazing. This was a Orion by Gail Brewer Giorgio from 1989. It was a first printing Tudor paperback Elvis Presley novel. Super valuable. If you happen to stumble on one of these, there's not a lot of them out there. I listed this thing for $74.99 plus media mail shipping. I got an offer of $70 even. I own it for about four and a half cents. So hell yeah, we're going to take that. <laughs> uh, so be on the lookout for that from 1989, uh, Orion by Gail Brewer Giorgio. Uh, she wrote another book called Is Elvis Alive, which I think is also reasonably valuable. I, as near as I can tell, these books must be out of print because that's a crazy number for a paperback. And now your flip of the week. Uh, this was a really interesting piece. I've had this thing for quite some time. It sold also in my 30% off offer, but is still a really, really nice sale. This is from 1887, The Queen of Angels or The Life of the Blessed Virgi Virgin by Ab Abby Orsini. It was an illustrated leather bound book from the obviously from the late 1800s in really pretty remarkable condition. It had very little cover wear. The pages were clean. Everything was intact. There was no damage to the spine. For a book that was 140 plus years old, it was in remarkable condition. I had it listed for $129.99 plus shipping. It's in my 30% off sale, so they saved 40 bucks, but it still sold for $90.99. This was part of a big estate sale purchase. Some time back, I've had this book for probably well over a year, but I probably own it for about a buck. Uh, and sold for $90.99, which is, uh, that's good business, as they would say. <laughs> uh, so that's about it for this week. Again, uh, as always, thank you to everyone who stops by and listens and or watches the show on a weekly basis. I do appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, I, I've said it before, and I, I have to remind myself sometimes that if I could, if you told me that two to 300 people would show up at my house once a week to sit here in my basement and listen to me talk about this stuff. I would think that was pretty awesome. So thank you to all of you who listen and watch. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, please do me a favor. It helps the channel tremendously. Smack that thumbs up button. If you know someone else who you think might get some value out of this content, uh, please feel free to share it with any of your like-minded friends. And of course, if you are not already a subscriber or a follower of the show, please consider joining us for that as well. That is going to wrap today's episode. Uh, I hope everybody is having a terrific week. That business is rebounding. Uh, so far, October has been a bit better than September. Still not great. Still not as good as August, but things are moving in the right direction. And we're starting to get geared up now for fourth quarter. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you saw anything or heard anything here today that was particularly interesting and how you're preparing for your fourth quarter. With all that being said, hey, it's time to sell. Thanks, guys. You have been listening to the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will catch you again next time.